figured we'd start off with um, some self intros uh, and take just the pure random order of what the what the bios are in the in the announcement. <laughs> so if you would, Ernest, uh, go ahead and uh, give us a quick intro. Uh, my name is Ernest Cisneros. Uh I've been working twenty plus years in some form of the confluence of geology and technology. Worked as a systems administrator, systems programmer, um, various jobs here and there. Um, of late, I've been doing mostly um, ground data systems for instruments and on NASA missions. So I've been working on, uh, right now, uh, the MassCam Z team for the Mars 20 rover. Uh, Psyche multi-spectral imagers on the Psyche mission, uh, an instrument called T2 CAM on the Lucy mission, uh, and also supporting the mass CAM instrument on uh, the MSL rover. So that's what I've been doing. Okay. Uh, and then next would be uh, Kristen, please. Oh. So hi, I'm Kristen Paris. I've been working in instrument operations and using Linux to do to to do so for a, about 10 years, a little over 10 years now. And that I started off working for the, working for Ernest in the lunar, for the lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera. And that's a camera that's currently orbiting the moon and has taken literally a couple million pictures. And so my job was part of the, was doing the downlink processing there and automating as much as I can. And I automated myself and a couple of my fellow coworkers out of a job which I was excited about because now I get to do other cool new stuff. The one was not, th he, ha he had a look of panic on his face, but he was fine. And <laughs> similar, the, the other one had a similar reaction, but I got to do cool new things. Yeah. And because of that, now I work, again, for Ernest, doing Mar mass cam Z downlink operations where I'm going to work on automating as much as I can, so I'm designing the downlink processing systems that we're going to be using. Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, my name's Corinne. I uh, work for you know these guys. <laughs> I've been following them since uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which I've also worked on. Um, I'm fairly uh, early career, so uh, today I am mostly representing uh, newly college grad graduates and everything. Uh, right now, I'm an operations engineer for the MassCam Z um, rover uh, camera, and she is my boss. <laughs> he. Um, um, I go to him and also Nathan whenever I have questions and problems and uh, they might hear something like Kristen or Ernest or Nathan please help and so yeah that's that's what I do <laughs> all right Nathan you figure out who's next that's me yeah all right <laughs> uh, I'm Nathan Clough um, been a, a longtime member of the plug group um, I've uh, been a uh, uh, in either a tech or s system administrator for the last um, uh, 22 years. Um, I've been at ASU for the last four years, um, and I'm I, I'm officially assigned to the uh, uh, MassCam Z project and um, a little bit on the uh, MSL project, um, but we kind of blend all in, and, and uh, so we you know we. We kind of all work on on Psyche and Lucy and 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 uh, the Luna Map mission, which should be launching eventually, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know hopefully in, within the next year. Um, and yeah, I'm a, a Linux uh, system administrator, so um, you know pretty much know what I do. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, let's start off with. I think everybody mentioned MassCam Z and MassCam. So let's start off with what are they, and and uh, what are we? What is uh, something you we're trying to get out of that? Uh, I'll, I'll yeah. take that. So <laughs> MassCam Mass Z is a high heritage instrument that's a pair of cameras on the rover. So if this were the rover, my arms, the mass, the the big bundle of instruments at the top. Normally when you see it, there's this big cyclops eye, and then down below there's a set of uh, cameras. Uh, actually, there's two sets of cameras, the mass cam Z and then the nav cams, which are outboard of the, the mass cam Z. Uh, mass cam Z itself 
um, is based on the MassCam instrument that's on the MSL rover. Um, the difference this go around is it actually has zoom capability. So on the MassCam instrument, one eye was fixed uh, with a focus short in on the workspace of the rover, and then one was the distant focus. And so with the new set of cameras, we can zoom in and out at uh, very varying focal lengths. Um, and we have slightly different uh, filters. Uh, it has a filter wheel with uh, seven filters that we use to take multispectral images, uh, panoramas of the surrounding area or of what we call the workspace area around the river that we're looking to do contact science with the, the ARM instruments. Okay, yeah. So, so the filters, I'm presuming they're not like, you know, Nowadays, everybody has cameras that have filters and stuff on them, so you can put mustaches on the Martians. So. What are we? <laughs> yeah, so, so these are two. They edit out the Martians. Yeah, <laughs> they, they mask all the, the Martian lifestyle, uh, life uh, on Mars. Uh, these filters are tuned to particular wavelengths, uh, both in the infrared and the UV, um, that uh, are characteristic to signatures for uh, geochemistry. So when we're looking at a rock outcrop, and we take a full suite of uh, observations uh, with all of the filters, we can um, combine those filters like in an RGB, but instead using these particular wavelengths, mm -hmm. and that will tell us, oh, this particular rock's high in iron, or this particular rock has magnesium in it. Uh, okay. So, that, so we use it to both differentiate geology uh, and then characterize it from lo location to location as we're driving along. All right, cool. And then the Z is for zoom, not a zoom. as a system, and I just presumed it was compression the whole time? No. <laughs> well, we do, uh, because uh, we are considered a deep space mission, mm -hmm. most of the data uh, take is, the initial data comes down compressed. So a lot of the mm -hmm. images that we acquire are JPEG compressed, come down for us to get an initial view. And then the original uh, high resolution images take a little longer for them to trickle down uh, to us. Uh, okay. Actually. Yeah, well, that, that leads to actually a question I had for Kristen since you're doing the downlink stuff. Um, so uh, one is, might be in, this, in, in the realm, but it's two questions. First of all, um, in general, kind of what is the, the ping time, min and max, between the Earth and Mars? I, 12 minutes, I believe, is the average. Is the average? OK. So it's better than what it used to be. So when, when Noel was here, we talked about it. He said it was 45 minutes. And I mean, it's, yeah, so, well, it's, this was a while ago, and I don't know what, maybe, maybe, maybe he was, he was taking the, you know, the, the space pony express to get his data. Um, <laughs> but, you know, normal TCP timeouts, you've got to do some extra things on the networking side, I'm presuming, right? I was, so for, Nathan and I are working through an, Exercise is not quite the right word, but we, so JPL has, they're using the Amazon, cl Amazon cloud for storing data. Mm -hmm. And so we have to access it to, you know, to get our data. And we have, there's a, been a particular data set that JPL has made available for scientists to do, to do um, stereo processing with. And so we need to download all of that data to host on our servers because JPL, they haven't, they don't, a lot, some of the scientists don't have accounts with, J, accounts with JPL, mm -hmm. so they have to use our servers to get the data. But we've discovered a fun bug, in, bug a, a feature, if you will, <laughs> in the ASU's firewall system where if we were downloading, I'm, I sent it, I was downloading a bunch of data and after a certain amount of, it's not a certain amount of time or number of files, it seems kind of, it mm -hmm. feels random, but it's, Probably not, but mm -hmm. the connection would time out, and then I, I don't have half of my files. And so when I'm downloading from a directory that has 9,700 files, and only half of them come through, I have to re there, there's no easy way right now to say, okay, well, I've got this half, let me download the other half because of the way the OCS commands are set up for <coughs> the client that they're using. Yeah, okay. That JPL is using. That's, and that brings, we had this suggestion out there. So do you have, for the, for the rover, you're getting images from the rover if you, if you lose connectivity and have to do it. Do you have R-Sync or do you have to just start again? So on, on the rover, uh, the, the camera system itself has a solid state data recorder mm -hmm. where all the observations we take are written to that. 
Then, depending on how we commanded it, a copy of that is handed over to the rotor compute element, the RCE. That then, depending on the priority that we've assigned it, queues it up for downlink. Downlink's dependent on either line of sight to Earth or one of the orbiting missions, Mars, um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or the Trace Gas Orbiter, uh, and MAVEN are three of the orbiters currently uh, circling Mars that NASA uses as a communication device. So as soon as one of those is in, in, com in a compass, we'll uplink and then downlink to, through those to the JPL Deep Space Network, mm -hmm. which, uh, like a network, assembles the packets, and then once that's complete, then that gets handed over to the operations group at JPL that then hands it over to the instrument teams. So okay. there, there is latency in the system and the software itself that, uh, like TCPIP, is trying to make sure that um, the packets for a particular file are completely downlinked uh, through the uh, telecom system before that file is flagged for deletion on the rover. Okay. So the rovers do can do point to point with the Earth? They don't have to go through the... They, they can, but okay. that geometry is, is you know, it, based on orbital dynamics. So it's not, it's, and, and it's relatively uh, rare, uh, the contacts aren't very long, so we don't get a lot of that time. With the omnis, uh, so there's a high gain antenna and there are what are called omnidirectionals. So we get a lot of omnidirectional contact, but the high gain antenna, which is used for most of the data downlink, uh, again, we have to be in the right geometry for okay. uh, the deep space contact and everything to line up. Okay. So we yeah. actually use the orbiters a lot. I thought everything had to go through the orbiter. So just, you know, redundancy is good, having options, right? Uh, you know, it's important to Mark Watney at some point. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, interestingly <laughs> enough, most of the commands going up, and especially critical ones where um, they're updating either flight software or something, are usually done Earth to rover direct as opposed to going through a contact. So. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, so that was that was the that was the second half. We kind of got into it anyway. With uh, was how we're getting the data back and forth, um, because it's you know you're not just SSHing to the rover and, and getting things right. <laughs> SCP data right. Um, yeah, it's an API for just <laughs> snap a picture now now right. You know you got you got to go through some stuff. Um, so and I'm gonna back up a little bit because because uh, last time we were here we had. Uh, um, us and Darren talking about Mars and the LRO as well. Uh, and um, we were talking about bandwidth. And uh, um, uh, uh, we had some conversations about the, the difference in the bandwidth between the two missions. Um, now, one thing that's happened since then, something that's come out in the news in the last year or so, uh, is reportedly that the LRO has now collected more data than all other NASA space, mission, space missions together. All so non-terrestrial. Yeah. Non-terrestrial. Well, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, SDO pretty much <laughs> blows every. Uh, SDO, the uh, Solar Dynamic uh, Observatory, is the CERN uh, laboratory data dump for planetary missions. So that generates more data in 24 hours than we do in a couple mm -hmm. of months worth of uh, uh, operations. Yeah. But. Uh, it used to be the planetary data system for NASA didn't really report how much data. It's just we have all these missions, all this wonderful data. Recently, they've been we're close close to approaching one petabyte of data. Most of that is from LRO, and most of that is from the the camera system on board LRO. So the the fact that we one have a, a short distance um, and our are uh, blessed by having this K band antenna at White Sands that does all our data downlink. We literally have a fire hose of data. So each day's command load is anywhere from 600 to 1,000 images that just, I mean, we're just churning images through through that system. And we've been doing it for well over 10 years. Now. Okay. So, so as Kristen said, it's over 2 million images that we've acquired of the lunar surface, both in high and low resolution. Okay. With the three cameras. All right. Are we finding things that are moving on there or anything <laughs> changing over time? So, yes. <laughs> so there's a, so it's, you can see landslides. 
Okay. There are uh, the boulder, so boulder, the boulder tracks are kind of my favorite. They're pretty cool. You see, you see an image of a crater, and you just see this cool track, and then this giant boulder that's probably the size of this building, like at the bottom, but based on the crater scale, it looks really small. Okay. And then uh, another a really important uh, one is new impact craters. Like we have seen new discovered new impact craters that have shown up since the mission began and they're small they're mm -hmm. a few few meters across but it's important because it, it gives us a better idea of how of when we land on the moon like how likely it is it that where we land is going to be hit by a small meteor because if you if you're standing there a few meters across is probably pretty significant <laughs> okay that's cool um so uh then I want to get into this a little bit later on. So we've got a few people have worked with uh, system administration at different times in your career. Um, so obviously we're a free software group. Uh, so can we, can we talk about some of the things you're doing on the back end and whether or not you're using Linux and free software tools on any of the off-planet instruments as well? On the instruments themselves? Yeah. Uh, why don't you talk about on the ground and then I can talk about what, what they're actually doing. Um, you know, we use a whole um, a whole bunch of uh, uh, open source um, tools uh, on the on the server side. Um, I mean, we're all of the servers where um, we we have are running Linux, um, mostly Ubuntu, uh, a couple um, old CentOS boxes that will fix that eventually. Um, um, and um, you know we're you know uh, you know any, anytime we have uh, any any new project coming up we you know I, I always try to try to find the uh, the open source solution for it um, we've you know we're you know we have various various things uh, that we're currently in development you know we're standing up a, a Ceph cluster um, we're you know um, you know we're we're, we're currently on uh, um, uh, or in the process of changing over our authentication to uh, open LDAP um, and, uh, and and um, and all sorts of you know typical sysadmin stuff. We, we, run, we run Postgres as <laughs> yeah. uh, our database. Post, yeah. Uh, so yeah, right. so it, it, today, I mean, like when I uh, back early career, we when we started bringing in Linux was mostly to hey, I'm going to make my workstation, let's play with it. Oh, let's do an NFS server. More than on clients, it doesn't like that. You know, just slowly evolving to now um, where predominantly everything in our shop is Linux. Um, we do have, uh, like Macintosh laptops, uh, mostly for Office and a couple other proprietary applications. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and the occasional Windows, but really, we could get by mostly with Linux. Uh, on the spacecraft themselves, um, within the last couple of years, Goddard has actually uh, uh, released something called CFS, the core flight software project. This is a complete set of software modules that allow you, if you were building a uh, CubeSat, uh, to to take their software, you still have to do um, modifications to it for your particular hardware mm -hmm. platform uh, and mission profile, but to take their CFS modules and build your flight software from that. And in fact, um, a lot of the uh, CubeSats that are slated to fly on the SLS, uh, if and when it launches, um, some a couple of those I believe are, are running variants of that CFS uh, software. So there has been this push um, to sort of build open source tools, um, uh, not, not only build them to, from the start, but also take existing projects in-house. Um, at JPL there's a lot of soft, uh, mission software that's slowly making its way out and becoming open source public projects that people can download. Okay, cool. A lot of those are very sp special purpose, so you know, mm -hmm. you're not gonna have a, a lot of need for uh, flight software and some of the, the software projects that they have available, but they're starting to see the light of day, so. 
I might get a really good drone someday. <laughs> so, um, so on, the, on that those lines, Kristen. So, for the automation you're using, are you using any tools that we'd be familiar with? Bash, bash. <laughs> lots of Bash, oh, uh, GNU plot, some Python. She does most of the Python coding, though. But yeah, mostly Bash. Okay. Well, like, so okay. So I'll, I'll go. I've got some more questions here, but I wanted to. to I had a different question for Karina in a second that would, would maybe open up for the, some questions from the audience. Um, but first, since we talked about it, what, what's some of the development you're doing? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a big project that I think I can talk about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, um, so um, JPL has this rover markup language that is basically like the code that of sequences of commands that we send straight over to, to Mars, to the rovers. And um, we also want to keep that um, information just, you know, for archiving purposes. But those, um, so it's RML based off of XML. And the format is a little funky just because they've been using whatever since the 90s. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. And I've been learning a lot of Python, which has been really fun for this specific project. Um, and I use fun as like a <laughs> sarcasm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, though, but um, yeah, I think Python is a incredible app or tool to use for these like one-off scripts. And yeah, just the, the libraries and the packages that are available that you can use and manipulate. I've been learning a lot, um, and it's yeah, highly recommended. Okay. Cool. So then the question I had for you, so you mentioned being kind of newer to the project. Um, so I wanted uh, two parts for that. One was what, what brought you to it? What, what got you interested in joining the group? And then the other is how did you find the opportunity and, and get it? What, what were some of the things that, that helped with that? Yeah, yeah so um, yeah, I'm very early career. So I was, um, I was about three years into a political science um, major, and I didn't like it. My favorite part of it was really the maps. <laughs> um, the maps, the maps were good. So I started um, doing, you know, more tech savvy things. By uh, it was like a data entry job at an insurance company, and one of my favorite projects was digitizing this like area code maps. And um, so I, yeah, I had to find like all the different tools using OpenStreetMap and stuff. And I thought this the stuff was really cool, but it was so repetitive. Like I could I could automate this. And um, th that was when I was really searching for a different career path and stuff. And I found geography and uh, GIS, geographic information science, which some of you may know. Mm -hmm. And I started studying that here at Arizona State University, which is the place uh, that hosts um, LROC, so yeah, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And they had a few student worker positions making um, 3D uh, digital terrain models. Um, which uses the stereo cameras and you know make all these beautiful like geologic maps, you know, really in detail. And that I was a student worker position that was open, and I was like, oh my god, I'm so underqualified. Like, I don't think they're they're gonna know how GIS applies to this. And you know, that was really cute of me because yeah, GIS, you know, that any kind of science really is, you know, you, applies to a lot of NASA missions and. I get, yeah, the rest is history. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And obviously, I've always wanted to work, or I didn't actually think I could work for NASA because there's very few, um, you know, people like me, <laughs> women, you know, women of color, blah, blah, blah. Well, but, yeah. And you parlayed that into an internship at JPL. Oh, yeah, yeah. I and, oh, yeah. And, then, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then applied for yeah. the job that you're currently on. Yes, occupying, yeah. So. And then that's why I say the rest is history because it was just, yeah, the, the fact that LRO is here at Arizona State University is really, really um, lucky. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got, we've got some really nice science program stuff going on at uh, both ASU and U of A and I think they're some in some ways you're connected where uh, different ways and, and uh, but you've got a lot of different projects going on which is really cool um, so uh, so with that uh, I want to see if anybody's got some questions oh, you, you 
talk about your 12 minute round trip time and your compressed and uncompressed data sets. So it's 12 minute one way or 12, so a 24 minute round trip. Yeah, time. yeah. Um, so having done uh, long distance TCIP IP back off problems and challenges on high levels of data, um, do you guys separate your data and control planes? Uh, <laughs> and when you say control planes. So there are methods for transferring data, i.e. I'm going to send my data bits yeah. via UDP, and then I'm going to use a control plane to verify yeah. the backside of that, which is going to use TCP, so I get my act, right? But yeah. I'm sending very little data in a TCP IP format, and I'm sending a lot of data in a, you know, a UDP uh, format. Yeah. So er early missions used a lot of um, code uh, in their operations that was derived, uh, written specifically for those spacecraft and, and communication protocols. Uh, in recent years, uh, the, God, I can't even remember the acronym, the CCD, dun dun dun, lots of C's, lots of D's. Um, the the, the C C CCSDC. Or thank you, yeah, the, uh, that standard of protocols which are very akin to TCPIP and uh, UDP uh, protocols are being implemented um, into the existing flight software to do that communication protocol. Um, and like an implementation depending on, on how it's implemented on the spacecraft, uh, like for LRO um, we use a CFDP protocol for our data downlink which ensures reliable uh, transfer of big data chunks, data files to the ground. Um, normally that's how we do it, but we also have what's called shotgun CFDB, which is basically like UDP, send it, and if you don't get it, okay, that's cool, you know, we'll get it on the next path, but we just want to get bits on the ground. And the ground software then does the reconstruction uh, of those data packets based on the, the headers and initial information sent in the first packet. So I'm not sure that's exactly uh, what you're talking about, but different protocols. sounds like you don't necessarily have a... Yeah, and we don't, so, yeah. Well, it, it's both ground and, and spacecraft, and, and that's, that's not the stuff that we do. That's a whole different group of engineers. Uh, I'm just aware of it uh, because we do have some projects at ASU uh, both with Luna Map and a student-run CubeSat project where we were actually having to look at what protocols do we want to implement to communicate with those uh, spacecraft. So, so I uh, got a little bit uh, deep into those for a period of time. Um, so yes, so the, there, there are currently now open standards uh, and like uh, the, CF, uh, the core flight software implements the communication module of that, implements a lot of these standard-based uh, Okay, and and so we since you weren't on mic, hold on a second. Since you weren't on mic, I'll I'll try to repeat the questions. The question was whether or not you're using a control plane for for control of the the getting the data, and then also data a separate data process for the bulk downloads, um, and then specifically relating to TCP IP and, and UDP. So it sounds like you're doing something similar, but you're not actually using TCP IP for your Connectivity that you're using. If you read the standard, it certainly reads a lot like a TCP IP uh, stack. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, um, and the way it's written, you can actually, uh, like with the way we use uh, the orbiters, uh, if it's set up the right way, it really is looking more and more like an internet uh, backbone where I'm just routing to this, this one goes to the next hop, and then winds mm -hmm. up at the eventual destination. Okay. And, that, and then I'm Presuming you were kind of thinking of Mars because you, you prefaced with the, the uh, ping time there. But for the LRO then that is on, you know, as they put it last time, essentially on a cable feed, you said the fire hose. Um, we don't have as much delay on that. You could possibly use TC, regular TCP IP for that. Or you're still using, trying to use the same protocol, so you're using the same so, thing. Yeah, yeah, we're using these standards, yeah. So on, like on the Psyche mission, which is going to the main asteroid belt, or Lucy, which is going to the uh, Jupiter Trojans, those are three AU out, so now we have even more latency, and mm -hmm. so um, we're talking about uh, real small data pipes uh, in terms of their real high latency. So we're really we're mm -hmm. looking at operations that's more lights out and uh, way after the fact if there are anomalies in terms of oh 
spacecraft is safe, your instrument has safe, now what do we do to try to recover? Okay, we've thrown at least one thing out of out of the solar system and it's still giving us data, yeah. right? So, you know, I bet there's a little bit of latency on that. <laughs> actually, yeah, actually, I'd, I'd like to yeah, figure out what that is, yeah. All right, uh, any other, Ed, you have a question? Well, I was just wondering, uh, with the um, uh, domain, uh, I guess, the transmission protocols that you use, are those related to what Vince Cerf was working on when he was extending uh, TCP IP uh, for low, high latency? Do you, do you know when he was doing that? Um, so the question is if, it's, if the networking they're using is similar to or related to the Vince Cerf's work on extending latency for TCP IP. Well, I think it was maybe a decade ago. He was, it, uh, it would not surprise me if, if some of his work did not make had to, has not made it into the standard uh, um, and again this is the standard is a large international consortium of uh, you have, is that uh, AVT is that, does that ring a bell no no so if he was doing a decade ago that would be newer parts of the state I mean we've got stuff that have been out there for longer than that so they yeah so yeah. Well, he was working on it to yeah. handle um, yeah. specifically uh, interplanetary. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would not be surprised if he dig into the documentation to find his work in there. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not. I haven't come across anything in the documentation that I've read that specifically points to his work. But uh, okay. But yeah, it's a large consortium. Another question. Um, so I, I'm curious about the architecture of the spacecraft today. Do you have kind of a, a kernel and device drivers and something familiar <coughs> that we, we'd see in a, in a computer device down here, or, or are they still real custom uh, setups with the, the instruments? The, you said the instruments have libraries that are that are opening up. So and, and again, it it largely depends on the institution building the spacecraft. So right now in the U.S., uh, the Applied Physics Lab of John Hopkins University, J JPL, Goddard, uh, uh, Ames, and there's a couple of other uh, commercial entities like Lockheed and Ball Aerospace who build spacecraft, and each one implements their own kind of software. Um, there's still very much, uh, even though Goddard's doing a lot of work with this uh, CFS software, they're still very highly customized to the particular mission. Because one, one of the things NASA is, is uh, in most space agencies, are they're very risk averse. So we always talk about heritage. To get a brand new, just thought this up last week, built it on my CNC in the garage, <coughs> it's bomb proof, send it into space. NASA is going to go, yeah, it's great, thanks, no thanks. However, you put it on a balloon and fly it up, you increase what's called its technology readiness level. And once you get at a certain level, and it's like from one to, I think nine is the, the max value. Uh, once you get up in the upper numbers for your TRL, then NASA is like, oh, okay, you've proven that you can fly it, operate, you've successfully operated, acquired data, done all these things. Same thing with uh, uh, spacecraft. If you've flown a, a, a flavor of your flight software and you have a similar mission, NASA is going to want to bring that flight software. So the, the, like in technology now where like I want to innovate and I do it all myself and I create this really wonderful new product, doesn't really happen within NASA. It's very slow creep. But companies like SpaceX, which they're building from scratch, they can do that technology development. Uh, so at least within the, the environment that we're working with, a lot of it's still this high heritage stuff that's very custom built um, uh, software. So how much Fortran code do you see? <laughs> uh, only my old, old, old home directories do I see any Fortran code. All right. Question about innovation. You mentioned that uh, it takes a long lead times for NASA to the risk averse. Um, how much innovation happens like here on the ground with using newer technology like um, configuration management with Puppet or Ansible or, or containers or things of that nature? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, actually, more so um, because it, it's easier to sort of prove it uh, in a non-critical role and then bring it into the more critical role. Uh, and anything that reduces the uh, deployment time from uh, initiation of a new version, testing, uh, so the, the sort of the DevOps model that we have now where, you know, you're continuously delivering software uh, and versions uh, is actually something NASA is interested in, but they still have uh, configuration boards that, you know, halt everything, let's review this, make sure it's right before we push it on to the spacecraft or the instruments or things like that. So there is a lot of innovation, uh, the, the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, the initial design for the whole ground system was to do it in the cloud. We've scaled back a little bit on that, but, but there's still a large uh, component of the operations that is now using the government, AWS services, Elasticsearch, uh, and various uh, resources within that to do operations, which is a new thing for NASA. So uh, when Mars 2020 flies and we're successful, and you know, with this team and the other team members who uh, we work with, there's no doubt that's going to happen. Um, it'll prove the technology and there will be less aversion to this kind of new, newer technology. Okay. So it well, happens. And, you know, the idea is uh, like uh, in the early days of Linux, administrators not telling their bosses, and oh, here's a Linux server. I just want to tell you it's a Linux server. Let me do it. Yeah. You're not sneaking it in, but you're just kind of like trying to propagate these mm -hmm. new technologies. So here's the service you asked for. So I want to combine the last two, though. So we, we, I think we need to, to uh, hook up a bunch of disks to a balloon and, and send the first Ceph cluster into near space. <laughs> Straight up to number seven. Look, we can send this to Mars. It's good. All right. <laughs> any, any other questions? Python 2, 3. 3, 1. What's the oldest that still works? That's probably what they're using. Yeah. <laughs> if you run a Python 1 application using Python 1 and run it with a Python 1 compiler, it will still work. <laughs> Yeah, so, I'm still yeah. seeing a couple we, packages that are, are still hanging around with Python 2. And yeah, so afterwards we can talk about banks and risk, risk aversion and uh, old versions of uh, Perl. <laughs> so, all right, but that's a little off topic for, for this. Um, so I actually want to bring it back a little bit to the cameras. So this was, a, this was a, a cool story last time. I don't know if it's the same mechanism, but... You were talking about, you, okay, with the mass cam Z, you'll be able to use the different filters to look at look an outcrop of rocks or something like that. The mass cam, currently you can go through and look at something. So what are some of the steps that you need to do in order to get some camera time, right? So you can't just, like I said, you, it's not just an API. You don't ping and go take a picture, right? Um, so you want to be able to schedule time, schedule resources that you need in order to be able to, to take the pictures. And then also, of course, get them back so you can find out if you got anything worthwhile, right? So uh, maybe a quick overview or... So, so step one, you have to be part of the science team for the, for the rover. Okay. And then they... Well, there was a shortcut for a little while. We can talk about that after. <laughs> <laughs> so JPL has a planning cycle. So whenever, so whenever they're planning a particular day or a sol on Mars, mm -hmm. they have this, they're calling it the tactical timeline. So we've got a, a limited amount of time to come up with a plan or to implement the plan that a separate timeline has come up with. Mm -hmm. So if you want, if, if you want... To, you're a scientist and you're like, I want a picture of that outcrop right there. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware of how close is the rover to it, is it going to be going near it, and you do this in this other campaign, or sorry, this other planning cycle called campaign implementation, and so that's sort of a longer lead time. So they're not planning the next day, mm -hmm. they're planning the next two to three days, maybe up to a week. Okay. So if you're on that, you have an idea of where the rover's heading and you can start pushing for we need to go look at that outcrop, and here's why I think we should look at it and take a multispectral image, a panorama, or some particular set of observations. 
Okay. And then that, com so there's people doing that for the MassCam Z cameras. There are also people that want to use other instruments on the rover. So once all of this kind of comes together, now there are rover planners that have to go through and figure out, okay, what can we do? What can mm -hmm. the rover do? Because you're power limited, you're, you're daytime limited. Yeah. And so you're resource limited. So then after, so then during that time, so then the, once the rover planners have their plan, you'll know if yours kind of made it into the mix. Okay. And then say you're, yeah, we're going to take an image of the outcry because we want to take a sample of it. So then the rover goes, rover takes the images, they come back down to earth, they're in the cloud, and then now JPL has software where the scientists can log in and view them, and then we'll also be hosting it for them to download the images. Okay. Yeah. So what are some of the resource limitations you would have on the rover for actually being able to take the, the picture once you're there? So uh, power is a big one, and then how much data downlink are we expecting to get from the, from the orbiters, mm -hmm. and those are the two big ones that I can think of. Okay. And then, sorry, I'll, yeah. before I forget, um, certain observations, like multispectral observations, yeah. are limited by time of day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you, so they, it works best during Martian noon, and then plus or minus an hour mm -hmm. or two on either side. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah. Watch out for dust storms and stuff. So one of the things that had come up before, with, if I remember correctly, you also had to schedule some time for heating up instruments. So yeah, the preheat period takes a certain amount of time, so yeah. that goes into what the rover planners work on. Yeah, didn't it's very rover cold just, on Mars. Done, just flip yeah. around. <laughs> so, no, yeah, it's taking, you guys have done some selfies. Those, those take a little, those, those uh, take more than just a little stick and flip the camera around. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, those, a little camera it's the arm. Arm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. one or two pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think one of the things you're alluding to is uh, most NASA missions have what's called a primary mission phase. And this is, uh, as originally proposed and accepted, uh, is the, the set of objectives that this mission is, is going to complete and answer some significant question. Uh, and during that period, there's this uh, uh, intense uh, work to ensure that we're going to meet those requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're different. Uh, uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, their primary missions were 90 Martian days long. And that, that was that. And so people are like, oh, they lasted. Well, they were designed to last a long time, but their primary mission was only 90 Martian days. Uh, some other, you know, some uh, primary missions are 10 years long, some are one year. LRO's uh, initial <coughs> mission was uh, a year and a half, including commissioning, for that primary uh, meet all requirement. Mm -hmm. Once those original requirements are met, obviously it costs a lot of money to build and, and fly these spacecraft. Then NASA can like, okay, what are other things we can do, including, including, or uh, looping in the public to, you know, what do you guys want to see? What are some of the things you're interested in. And so that's when the education public outreach uh, opportunities to get the general public, the armchair uh, uh, scientists involved in, in, in the mission. Mm -hmm. In some cases they can do it. Uh, I think Juno is one where a lot of their data comes back and is out in the public for armchair scientists to mash up to create products with. So that's a, an excellent uh, example of, from the get-go, the mission is, is mm -hmm. engaging the public. Other missions, you know, sometimes there's that primary mission where we're focused on those requirements and then we kind of relax and, okay, now, now what are the fun things we can do with the, the spacecraft? So with the education, are you still doing school tours? Do kids get to come in and look at what you're doing? And Yeah, so, if you've ever been to ASU, uh, and if you've ever visited Moore Hall or uh, the LRO Science Operations Center, uh, you know, there's kind of, you look in and there's people doing operations and in the, L the LROC Science Operation, there's a glass wall kind of about that length with folks. And the ISTB4 building, uh, where we're working out now at the first floor, it's a large atrium, large glass, uh, area with big tile wall, lots of dual screen Linux systems. So now anybody walking through in school tours, um, I forget the numbers, but we get several 
tens of thousands of students uh, over uh, each year wow. coming through there and watching and being uh, talked to about what's going on inside that mission operations room. Cool. Do you get some out-of-state students as well? Or? Yeah, we, yeah. We, yeah, we get, uh, it's really, I think we get out of state, we get uh, geology field trips, they'll come through and they'll stop in and check out what we're doing. And, conferences. Yeah, yeah conferences. Uh, the building is multi-use, so we'll have like this, we'll have a conference that's not related to, to any of the work that we're doing, held in the building and they're getting tours of uh, what what's going on inside okay. the facilities. So. And they also have the clean rooms on the yeah. Yeah. south side of the, you know, where oh, they can yeah, actually watch. <laughs> Aircraft being built out of the Luna uh, map. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Luna map. Um, it's, okay. it's actually there. In you know, if you go to the first floor, you can look inside and see, you can actually see the spacecraft that's going to be launching. Okay. Um, and what are the hours for that next week? <laughs> Any time between you know, uh, I don't know, uh, eight thirty. It and opens up at eight a.m. Yeah, it opens okay. up at eight. All right. And closes at it's the clean. I, I might have a kid on anyway. spring break next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, okay, rovers, we had, we, uh, a few years ago, we threw a couple rovers at the planet, and, and that was, that had a three-month mission, and, uh, went on longer than Gilligan's Island. Um, so, so, um, what, I honestly don't know, what functioning rovers do we have on Mars right now, and, and how long have they been there? Curiosity, uh, which is the Mars, so, the Mars Exploration rovers were, uh, A and B, or Spirit and Opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, those both now are defunct. Uh, Opportunity died about a year ago. Yeah, something year like ago. Yeah. Okay. Or, end of mission. Sorry, was end of mission was declared over a year ago. It actually died way earlier than that. It's like global, six months, eight months before yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Global okay. dust storm that enveloped Mars. So the Mars Science Laboratory, or AKA Curiosity, is the, currently the only functioning rover. Uh, on the surface, uh, and lander, and then inside uh, the lander uh, is doing operations as well. And then in July, uh, coming up, we'll launch March 2020, uh, and that will land February of 2021. So okay, have two rovers, a landed mission, and uh, orbiters that we have. So it'll take about eight months to get there. Uh, six, six, six eight plus months. months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then right. um, ExoMars just announced a delay. So they were going to launch also in July because that's the optimal orbit. But ExoMars just had to officially delay it to 2022, which is the next best chance for that orbit to, um, yeah. for them to land. So we, we try to do it when they're, when they're nearby. And yeah. 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 So, so yeah, speaking of that, um, uh, uh, important thing for all infrastructure is uh, getting... Um, uh, downtime for maintenance uh, and uh, at scale Nathan and I were talking about this a little bit so how often do you get downtime and why well the one the uh, <laughs> the, the downtime that I look forward to is the uh, uh, Mars solar conjunction yes. um, that that is when the earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the Sun uh, we obviously can't get you know, uh, send or receive anything during that time and it's about two weeks and that happens approximately every two years. Um, so I, I, I definitely look forward to that time because uh, <laughs> everyone kind of chills out. And we can we can, we can shut things down and, <laughs> and do some updates. And, yeah, so yeah. you get downtime if you need it or not. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's no not, delay. Yeah, nothing's going to be going on. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, oh, we're not ready. Can we push that off two weeks? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you, yeah, and usually around Christmas, uh, there's a week about a week break before Christmas to New Year's where operations scales way down. Okay. The cool thing about conjunction is, because I, I did some, uh, I was on downlink shift for Opportunity when it was still working, and when conjunction, when it's nearing conjunction, you could actually see the degradation in the data, and then they just wouldn't get data because uh, the sun yeah and then you know you would start getting data back and it's just kind of cool to, to note that degradation like this is so cool like space oh <laughs> this is yeah so our la the last conjunction happened in in august of last year and so you know obviously wh why we're launching in in july is because it, mars is coming back around yeah. the sun and and uh, 
you know, kind of 90 degrees from us right now, I guess. And, and uh, you, know, soon, you know, so once we launch, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll catch up, and that's, you know, that's why it's the best. Uh, you know, we have our launch window mm -hmm. this year because of that uh, uh, you know, the movement of planets. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So uh, for the two weeks where, where uh, Mars is out of contact, do you still have stuff going on? Do you have recordings going on? You just set up a cron job that goes and grabs a picture every two hours and see what you get? Do you have, um, you mentioned ke keep storing stuff on, on Flash. Do you end up with uh, degradation Either of you know long you know the two week storage of of a of a image waiting for it to come back, or over time I'm presuming there's got to be degradation over time uh, as well. So no, generally during conjunctions the 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 rover is kind of put in a maintenance mode okay. because the fundamentally what you be because communications are difficult not impossible but difficult mm -hmm. though worst thing to happen is to say, hey, we're going to let the rover drive, and it falls. And then, because you don't have reliable communications, then you can't reliably recover the rover. Okay. So you generally kind of park it somewhere nice. Uh, you know, it'll wake up, uh, continue to maybe try to dump data that it still has on the solid-state recorders. Okay. Um, so over the lifetime of the mission, there's certainly degradation of uh, the electronic components. Most of them are, are hardened for their particular environments. Uh, like the Juno mission, most of the electronics are buried in the core of the spacecraft inside this lead-lined box uh, to, uh, to shield it from uh, the intense radiation in Jupiter orbit. Okay. Um, so you'll you'll get uh, the you know at the beginning of the mission like a hard drive we've mapped out all of the, the memory locations and over time you may get hey this memory location is now correct mark it bad we don't write to it this one's okay. bad uh, on LRO we actually had a situation where if we wrote across the boundary of two of the memory chips it would always corrupt the image didn't quite understand why, but we could replicate it. And so basically, we permanently wrote a corrupted image to that and left it there so we would never write in that area of the, uh, okay. of the memory map. So, you know, over time, you get these little weird, funky things going on with the hardware. Okay. Do a Jetter eye and <laughs> yeah. don't ever change that one again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you, and you get that in the, in the CCD as well. You'll get like a hot pixel before launch, mm -hmm. then it goes away, and then you get one in a different area. Yeah. So is it, is, it, is it corruption or just like Moon Man steganography? Uh, some of it's uh, <laughs> uh, transient cosmic ray uh, type interaction. Some of it is permanent damage to the instrument uh, if it gets hit by a cosmic ray or other uh, energetic particle in the right way. Okay. Mike, you had a question? Well, I mean, you're talking, you know, six month flight time, six month plus month flight time out. Um, obviously, you have to have the hardware sitting at you know Kennedy or wherever it's, it's going from, it, it, you know, well before things go. So you're talking Python one or Python two or Python three. So what's the average age of your hardware the day it flies? <laughs> That's a good <laughs> question. Probably. Yeah, because I, I plan for things like in calendar years, right, or yeah. fiscal years, right. We may start and finish a project. In that my, my servers were were made and shipped and racked and, and, and everything went in inside of a, a fiscal year, and I'm just curious because that sounds like you yeah. got a whole different. So let me get the the question in the mic. So the question is, what what is the average age of the hardware as it gets ready to launch? Because you've got a lot of props and you and again you're like you said earlier, NASA doesn't want the new shiny stuff. They want stuff that has been proven. Yeah. So uh, so. It, it depends on the component. So certainly there are components that are um, build a print. Um, they are based on heritage instruments, and they are uh, we. Uh, let's see. Let me let me see if I can do this math. So the rovers at the Cape uh, about uh, two months ago, it was still at JPL finishing what's called ATLO, the uh, assembly testing and launch operation uh, portion there. Uh, and probably eight months prior to that, 
uh, most of the instrument components were being delivered. A year out from that, the rover uh, was being uh, started to begin to be assembled uh, because the, the actual chassis was a flight spare for uh, the MSL rover. Uh, so that the chassis is probably the oldest component. Um, and then coming forward, probably there are components in there that are flight spares that we're using, so they may be a couple of years old uh, for things like stepper motors and other components like that. Uh, and they're all lifetime tested, so as long as we haven't been using them, they're, they're good to go. Uh, but probably a lot of the components are actually within a, uh, a year of when they're actually delivered and integrated onto the spacecraft. Uh, so the heritage is high. The component, actually, most of these things are built. I mean, they don't exist in um, stepper motors. We may, you know, companies may buy in bulk and have them sitting on the shelf, and they'll put them in, into the camera system themselves. Lenses are usually all uh, ground, cut and ground uh, to spec at that uh, during usually that year leading up to delivery. So the actual components. By uh, the time the spacecraft uh, arrives at, we're looking at maybe two to three year old equipment, um, components that were bought uh, or uh, uh, built uh, uh, mm. for the rover. Okay. Well, it's all, all built in the clean room, so there's no dust bunnies or anything. So. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Like the generation set. So my servers may have been manufactured, but their whole, like, their processor is a, a Gen 12, or whatever, right. right? It's within. Maybe the last yeah. six to 12 months of release cycle. So, for you guys on the generational part of the technology, what are you looking at it for? Um, well, so if you're looking at like MassCam Z, the, the, it shares heritage with MSL and also going back to, um, I think it's Marcy on. Um, MRO? Yeah, uh, is it MRO? So. And then, oh. and then there may be a camera system on Odyssey. So that heritage. So we're looking at maybe fourth generation, fifth generation uh, design of that kind of camera system. Uh, and they have other. Uh, so L Rock was uh, based on uh, CTX, which was uh, so it was maybe Gen two or three of that design. Um, so that's, you know, again, a lot of the stuff's uh, build to print, new, new, but based on heritage design. And all design modifications go through a change control process, you know. If I'm going to change a screw, I have to go through the process of explaining why I'm changing that screw out for this new screw, this different screw. This is titanium, that was something else, and what, you know. This vendor could only give me 11, and now I can get 200, you know, the, the whole process. And then sometimes JPL says, oh, we don't like that one. We want you to go to this vendor, buy that component. And so you, you have to go get that component from them. So, so it's, a, it's a very interesting process. There's a lot of negotiations throughout. The, we accept your design, and just in the terms of because the spacecraft uh, the rover or the, the orbiter is going through design like LRO uh, at one point had a problem with the launch vehicle so they put us on a larger launch vehicle which let us blow up the design of the spacecraft which solved some mass issues that we were having like we were tightly constrained on mass and when we went to a bigger spacecraft design we could oh we don't have those mass uh, requirements anymore so we could kind of uh, wiggle our rooms out of that. Uh, my question on GIS, but before that, so it's geography on Earth, it's selino, selenography on the moon, what is it, what's the word for Mars? A Aero, A yeah. geodesy, A-E-R, -A like yeah. for Aries, oh. yeah, I think, yeah. The best point is I've worked with the GIS data, and the fun part of GIS data is zip codes change over time, city limits change over time, you can't, you no know, census records change every census, and you can never figure anything out because you can't ever normalize it. <laughs> so how do you deal with, you know, starting with Viking, right? How do you normalize all the data, starting with the Viking mission, all the way to now? 
Well, let, let me preface that while she's thinking about that. Her answer is, at, at least for Mars, there is still a large debate as do we have uh, uh, 0 to 360 or positive 180 going to the east or positive 180 going to the west. Mm -hmm. okay. We settled on that. <sighs> oh. We for the moon. That, so it, so the, the problem, of course, is always just because someone issued a standard doesn't mean everybody does it to that yeah. standard. So you're all on metrics now. Yeah. So <laughs> so that, that that's constantly the problem and or somebody created a data set and distributed it in a sinusoidal, but it was kind of a wonky sinusoidal, so when you take it and ingest it and try to regularly map project it to something else, it doesn't quite mesh and you're like, okay, what happened there? So there are always a lot of issues when trying to, especially for global data sets, normalize them to one another. In fact, we spent a lot of time trying to get things to line up to, um, uh, at least for the moon, again, because of the Apollo landing sites uh, and the surveyor and the Russian sites uh, with their retro reflectors, we have some really good geodetic control points. And the control network is much better. For Mars, eh, not so much. And, and then the issues with mapping projections, and it's, it's kind of a little bit of a mess. It's getting better, but yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, to close that off, um, since uh, you know, a lot of planetary science is very academic, so you have like very you know, similar groups of people kind of making all these decisions. You know, there's only so many lunar scientists, only so many Martian scientists. Uh, the census stuff, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot going on, lots of different governments and stuff. So uh, I think, yeah, the, the one benefit about planetary science is it's a small community. So, you know, people have to be able to communicate and agree with each other about certain things. For, for the lunar stuff, have you been uh, loading all that up into uh, OpenStreetMap? Um, <laughs> even better. <laughs> so so when, when we were in the design phase for the Science Operations Center, uh, because we were going to be collecting global uh, data sets. In fact, with the wide angle camera, uh, every month we get a global data set. So being someone who believes in standards and, okay, I, I'm not gonna write, I could go write software, but I'm not gonna write software. Let's, there's open standards. What What's out there? Oh, WMS, oh, that's the standard we want. Okay, who implements that? Oh, here's some software. None of it works for planetary <laughs> because all <laughs> of it assumes you're, you're, you're dealing with terrestrial data sets. Yeah. So we actually went through a whole process of, of evaluating a lot of different data uh, software products. ARC does it, but of course it costs a lot of money and we were like, yeah, we're not gonna do that. So uh, we luckily had someone who was very talented on our staff, he's still there. We said, uh, you know, I could probably, the WMS standard's not that hard. I'll, I'll go away and I'll write a server, a WMS server for it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so about a week later, he goes, eh, so I think it's working. Uh, and he had, you know, still rough, but uh, over, so, so there's a software package called LunaServe, uh, and it's an implementation of the WMS standard that works really well with planetary data sets. But in fact, we've, as demonstration, we have all our data, uh, the LRO uh, data and uh, global data sets from other instruments on LRO, but we've also uh, have global data sets for Mars, Mercury, a lot of the Saturn and Jupiter moons as a demonstration of what you can do. And it uh, okay. supports a wide variety of uh, raster products, numerical layers, database backends, it understands post-GIS. A database extension. So it, it really is a really nice back end. And people are like, oh, so can you, and like, it's not front end software, it's all the back end stuff. So you still have to have the front end. It works well with Arc Info or uh, QGIS. You can connect to it, load layers, do mapping on it without ever having to d actually download data. Okay. So. Cool. All right. <laughs> uh, do we have any other well, questions on that? I have a hardware topic. Is there any like design considerations that you have to go through? Obviously, temperature, cold, heat, radiation, kind of above and beyond. You know, 
low level hardening. So what are har hardware hardening design you know constraints you have for throwing something off the planet and hoping it survives? I mean, yeah, we have, uh, it, again, every mission, uh, like, uh, I'll talk about Psyche, the multispectral imagers on there. The most difficult design question we've been trying to resolve is not in the design of the camera itself, but the shock loads that JPL thought the instrument would experience at launch and that the instrument would not survive because we hadn't demonstrated the... Uh, uh, an ability to, we hadn't actually experienced that shock level, therefore we couldn't actually demonstrate that we would survive that shock level even though we had lots of uh, um, numerical studies that said, yeah, well, it's at the upper end, it will be fine. Well, it turned out uh, the Psyche mission just uh, recently uh, selected the Falcon Heavy as our launch vehicle, which dropped those shock numbers way down, and so now that's no longer an issue or hopefully will no longer be an issue for us. So, so it, it's really weird what gets latched on to. Um, I think on uh, LRO, one of the design features that got latched on to was the design of the camera body, the telescope body. Um, and they didn't, they, the review panel wasn't sure that uh, it would actually be in focus uh, because it was required to be um, dehydrated for it to be in focus and if it had taken on an appreciable amount of water and we didn't uh, heat it up and burn off that water we'd be out of focus so the review panel fixated on oh you guys you know you haven't demonstrated that you can actually bake it out and it'll be in focus and blah blah, blah. because on the ground of course it we're focused at infinity so in the when we're in the atlow chamber at, at environmental uh, doing environmental testing, you can't really take a picture with it by itself. You have to put a collimator to hopefully get the right optics to say, look, it's in focus. So it, it all worked out. It takes beautiful pictures and, you know, but it's, it's very funny. Uh, yeah, and to date, I think the, uh, at least for the projects that I've worked on, none of them have had any real, real design issues that we had to tackle um, yeah um, most of them have been pretty straight straight straightforward and most uh usually the review panel you know fixates on something that they gotta they gotta pick on something so <laughs> pick on that all right um so this is uh a story i picked up i thought i, I heard about it over at asu so it might it might not even be a group that any of you worked on but they were talking about um uh coming up with some innovations on solar panels in order to have rounded corners on them so you could basically fit more solar panels in on particular basically they had a rounded thing that they could put solar panels on by being able to put holes in rounded stuff they were able in in they were able to take it more advantage of the surface that was available you know, less wastage. Not a project that I'm familiar with okay. or that we're working on. Right now. Cool. I think it might have been something that came up on this Space Night thing a few years ago, so it could be something. Okay. I just go ahead. So, but that leads to, or, or did you have some? Uh, no, okay. I, was just I was just wondering if there was any methodology or tool that you use to manage your constraints. And by constraints, you mean, our, well, so with most NASA missions, we start with a set of overarching requirements, these things, and then those start to flow down into design of the spacecraft, design of the instruments, design of the ground system to support all that. Um, specifically, our, uh, here at ASU, we tend to, uh, because we're not tasked with the safety of the spacecraft, we don't have as formal a requirement. Uh, at JPL, I know they use something called NG Doors, which is a commercial product, and JIRA and some other things that are commercial products to do the requirements tracking, uh, issue tagging to those requirements to keep all that so when we get ready to launch, you can go. Every issue has either been resolved or a waiver has been written against it, and you're okay to go. Uh, internally, I think we, we do a lot of um, 
because we don't have as big of a system, mostly spreadsheets uh, or database tables to, we're tracking this and, and keeping, making sure we're resolving all the issues that we need to resolve. Okay. Then I actually have a question for, for each of you, or give each of you an opportunity to answer it if you'd like. So what's something surprising or cool or interesting that you learned? Whether that be, you know, found this cool Python module that solves this thing you couldn't do before, or, wow, we didn't know they had those types of rocks up there, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so it could be something along the lines of what you're doing or something you, you, that you saw another group experience, just something you thought, this makes working here cool. I mean, okay, one or two things, okay? <laughs> Each of you could probably give us a 10 hours off the cuff. So one or two things um, that, that you'd like to bring up. Kristen? Uh, my favorite, this is one of the <coughs> things I, I mentioned it in the bio, where the, I like learning about things. I learn a lot about things when they fail. So that, that is how I figure out how things work. And so working on developing the pipelines for processing the LROC images, we used image magic for, uh, to resize images. And I, I can't remember exactly what we used it for, but th this is where, so we had a, like a 200 plus computing cluster that, yeah, like 200 plus node computing cluster that we would use to process our data. Cause you know, potentially thousands of images, you know, Ten, th not tens of thousands, but thousands of images a week. And, you know, we had a lot of computing power for that. And using image magic to do what we had to do with the images, there's an environmental variable that if you don't set it, image magic tries to help you where it uses all of the cores available on your machine to run the process. <laughs> and the computers we were running were 48 cores a piece. And the way our processing cluster was set up was the default was one, one core per job. But each of those cores, so, so the computer's running 48 jobs and all 48 jobs are trying to use all 48 cores. <laughs> and so it brought the computing cluster to a screaming halt. And it's just, it was just this insight into like, why don't people document this? Like, this is a very important environment variable that users should be aware of. But if you're working on your laptop, eh, it's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. But but I, I learned a lot in that process of like tr of like how to troubleshoot third party software, and so that that was a fun experience. And then my my second thing is uh, the LRO orbiter. One of our neck. So there there are the two cameras, and it's got the like there's the camera body, and then there are these radiators. And one of, the ra one of the radiators was struck by a micrometeorite. And the, the image is online. They made a featured image out of it. So the way the camera operates is it's a line scanner. And it builds the image using the motion of the spacecraft. And so, you, you're, so when you're looking at the image, the image is fine, image is fine. And then all of a sudden, it's all wavy. And you just kind of watch it. You can see it, the pattern kind of like die down. And then it's back to normal image. And it's just like. This is so cool! Like I work it. Like this is stuff I get to see evidence of. I, I think oh. we we uh, we're allowed to rightfully claim the only instrument <laughs> to survive a micrometeorite. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. think it mm -hmm. lots of other instruments, but we could prove it. Like yeah. there's really evidence. Cool. Yeah, it's it's that, really yeah. It's just just like that. What? A Rod Serling took over from me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, oh, well, <laughs> narrowing it down. <laughs> um, I'll go with uh, a science one from the moon. Uh, staring at, you know, images of the surface of the moon. One of my favorite things that we have been able to learn from or using the LRO data set is that uh, we've discovered that the moon is actually shrinking. And that's the evidence is uh, with all these geologic features called wrinkle ridges and and lobate scarps and stuff so basically the moon is compressing because it was once very very hot and perhaps it could still be warm in there but the fact that it's you know shrinking is fascinating we wouldn't be able to have or know that unless we've had 
years worth of data, which we are able to have because of Velro. Okay. So my wife tells me that, that the moon is moving further away. Is it just as shrinking away, or is it moving <laughs> and shrinking? <laughs> Both. We're very lucky to have it right where it is at this point in time. <laughs> it won't be there forever. It's leaving us. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Love inching away. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, what fascinates me about the job, I... I <laughs> The way you break LDAP? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. breaks well, you. I, I mean, I, I introduce myself as, as lead system administrator, but I'm also a junior administ system administrator because <laughs> I am the system administrator. So, I mean, I, I, get a, I get to get my hands dirty with just a lot of different things, um, and sometimes more than what I want to, um, you know, juggling everything. And um, But what's really cool about working in, in this in the group um, I mean I, I I'm not a camera guy or anything I'm I, I don't know much about geology or and you know the the space stuff is just what I read in the news but you know just guilty by association just being here and you know I you know getting to see you know images that you know that no you know first <laughs> that nobody's mm -hmm. ever seen, you know, getting to see the, you know, the pictures of the rovers and, and it, uh, right up close and everything, um, you know, or, or even um, during the, uh, the outlaw testing when, um, you know, you know, getting to see that the very first picture of that, that the rover took with the, the mass cam Z cameras um, fully assembled and, you know, it, I mean, it wasn't really, it, it was just, you know, a dot pattern on the wall. Mm -hmm. But that was the very first picture that the rover took with our cameras, and being able to see that and just being, you know, being part of that group is, you know, amazing, and it's, an, you know, just awesome to be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, boy, cool. it's like uh, there, there, I, I, you know, I've been doing this long enough that there are are literally, you know, we go all night on on, and all of them are interesting. Uh, in their own right but the thing that I'm amazed most by is how you can get you know here's four people the Mars 2020 rover team I don't know how many thousands of you know if you're looking at the JPL team and all of the instrument teams how many different people uh, not only in terms of background uh, ethnicity, uh, and just diversity of all types, to bring all of those people together to actually make something that functions and works and does an amazing job, mm -hmm. to me is, is one of the most amazing things of this, this work. And people who talk about, oh, I want to work for a NASA mission, I think it's so cool. Uh, it, it, it is very cool, but it is also very demanding, and we've had in fact, recently had had somebody who wanted to do the job and then realized the job requires just a bit more than I'm willing to give, mm -hmm. uh, and that's cool. I mean, you know, that's uh, you have to know these things. But uh, I love the fact that we can bring such a, divide, a diverse group of people together and build an amazing piece of machinery. Uh, to me, that's the the coolest thing. I think. Well, I'd like to say a couple things, and we'll we'll wrap up. So, first of all, uh, one. I, I think it's amazing we have a resource like the missions that you guys are doing and, and, and the four of you here in town, right? Um, and I, you mentioned working on different projects and, and how much work is. I also know that you guys end up doing a lot of, of jobbing. You, know, you got this mission, you got this mission, and how do you get the, you know, so somebody's got to go get the grant or whatever funding for it. Um, it. You're not selling enough postcards to fund the missions, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so there's there's a lot of work that goes into it aside from the engineering and the and the science that to go through, um, and then uh, you know we get lucky sometimes and like the, the you mentioned uh, spirit and opportunity on their three three month missions that then went on for years after that and other grad students got to come in and work on their PhD as as those were going on, um, so uh, I think it's it's awesome that we've got those here in town that we've got some uh, fantastic resources, brilliant people uh, doing things. 
Uh, and I specifically want to thank the four of you for coming and sharing this evening. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope everybody else enjoyed it. Please come back again. Thank you.